Uh, good morning, I'm John Gribben. Uh, welcome to the IWNHL 2016 meeting in sunny San Diego. We've just had our first session on T-cell lymphomas and I'm joined by, that we could safely say, the glitterati of the T-cell lymphoma world. Uh, Elaine Jaffe from NIH, Laurence de, uh, de Laval from um, uh, Lausanne and Francine Foss from Yale. I mean, it's been a recurring theme in the last few years meetings that you know, T-cell lymphomas really used to be kind of the Cinderella of the lymphoma world, but you've been having an increasing prominent role. Uh, and I think that reflects the huge kind of changes that are ongoing in, that we've just been discussing. So, Elaine, there were, within the new classification, uh, a real focus on the, the understanding of the molecular changes that are underpinning these um, T-cell lymphomas. So you just wanted to kind of summarise for us where the changes are in the 2016 classification compared to where we were before? Um, certainly. So uh, as you know, the uh, uh, revised uh, WHO classification was published in two companion articles in, in Blood, and uh, uh, those uh, highlight the, the changes in the classification which will be included in the upcoming uh, monograph. Um, the changes in the classification of, of T-cell lymphoma affect both nodal and extranodal uh, lymphomas. In the nodal lymphomas, there's uh, increasing recognition that uh, tumors of T uh, FH origin, T follicular cell origin, are, have many common features, in, including common mutations, and those are, are grouped um, under a common uh, framework uh, with uh, angioimmunoblastic T cell lymphoma and other uh, T cell lymphomas of TFH origin. In uh, the uh, extranodal lymphomas, a, a major change is the recognition that enteropathy associated T cell lymphomas comprise two distinct groups with different epidemiology and different uh, uh, molecular uh, findings, and those include uh, what we now call enteropathy associated T cell lymphoma uh, of the classic form and uh, monomorphic epitheliotropic uh, T cell lymphoma, formerly uh, EATL type 2. Mm. I'd say those are the, some of the two biggest changes. Sure. Now, we focused a lot on the molecular changes underpinning that, in particular the identification of specific pathways that appear to be deranged. Now, some of those struck me were in common among different types of groups. Um, so. In the end, do you think it's going to be the morphological changes or the molecular changes which are going to really be underpinning how we kind of group together these changes? Yeah. So um, if I could answer, uh, I mean, I think that those will go to some extent uh, in tandem. So uh, we, we've seen that, for example, the Jack Chat Jack stat pathway is is uh, uh, deregulated in many of the cytotoxic T cell lymphomas. So we can recognize those from using p conventional pathologic tools, but um, th they correlate with underlying uh, molecular alterations. And the molecular alterations will, of course, be the focus of, of, of new drugs targeting um, those kind of pathways. So which are the kind of major pathways that you think are the ones that we should be thinking about in terms of trying to tackle? So there, there's been really a, a flurry of, uh, of discoveries over the past uh, years. So we, 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 we try to see uh, some, uh, some schemes and some, some grouping of the pathways, but I think the picture is not yet uh, complete. There are several families uh, of, of genes that are uh, involved invariably according to entities. I think uh, a common uh, pathway of alterations involves genes controlling epigenetics at, at large. And uh, interestingly, there appear to be uh, different genes involved in different disease, uh, talking about the same category of epigenetics. Uh, there's a lot of uh, the, the cytokine signaling pathway, the JAK-STAT pathway, appears to be uh, autonomously uh, activated by mutations in, uh, in many lymphomas. And today we specifically uh, focused in, in my lecture on the T-cell receptor uh, pathway that appears to be the target uh, 
of um, various mutations, also translocations that were either recognized by standard genetics or more recently uh, by uh, sequencing. Those gene fusions are evidenced more easily and uh, there are many more than uh, previously uh, previously recognized. So these are uh, pathways that I can uh, think of then uh, intracellularly and, uh, and the transcriptional uh, levels there, there might be overlap uh, in the groups of genes sure, that are regulated, but before, exactly. it's a lot of uh, complexity. That's Francine, that of course rings in its own challenges. So that is in an era where we're approaching a precision med, I think you use the term precision medicine approach in the T-cell lymphomas, is how do we identify who are the right groups of patients to potentially go on to the right targeted therapies? Or do you think it'll be wider combination approaches, takes all, and then an exploratory look at who are the patients who respond best? I think it's going to be more the latter at this point, John, because I don't think we know exactly you know, what those markers are going to be. But we have gleaned some, some evidence from what we've done so far in the clinic that the expression of epigenetic um, mutations in angioimmunoblastic T-cell lymphoma uh, does mirror the clinical effect of HDAC inhibitors where they're very um, effective in that subgroup, perhaps more so than some of the others. With respect to, say, the expression of CD30, for instance, you know, the ongoing trials with brentuximab vidodin have required a minimal level of expression, but we really don't know how much expression one needs in order to have a clinical response. And so I think it's best at this point in time for those trials to be fairly broad-based. And then um, as a secondary analysis in those trials, we can try to see if we can figure out if there is a biomarker or a level of expression that correlates with a clinical outcome. So it's always difficult to extrapolate from the this molecular data um, and the biology of the tumors and what pathways are activated to what actually happens in a patient. Because again, you know, we, we could use a pathway targeted agent um, and that may not benefit the patient because of the complexity of other pathways that are also activated and other things that are going on biologically in those tumors. Now the other, of course, importance of the biomarkers we're talking about are the potential for pro prognosis as in addition to identifying specific pathways. So there's actually more controversy discussed about the potential role, for instance, of transplant. You know, who, is a, who has poor enough risk to merit a particular type of approach? So in, in where are we in terms of looking and using these kind of more novel markers to help us identify who are the subgroups of patients that should or should not be considered for transplant? Unfortunately, we really aren't very far with, uh, with respect to identifying on a molecular or, or more precise um, method of who's actually going to benefit from a transplant. The only thing that we really have at this point is, is clinical observations um, and clinical prognostic factors such as chemo responsiveness and low IPI, for instance, and perhaps certain histologic subtypes that we know do better with autologous transplant. Uh, we haven't yet gone back and looked at those samples and looked for these molecular markers. Um, as we plan future trials, though, I think that we need to start stratifying patients. We need to identify what the most important markers are and stratify. So an example of that would be DUSK22 in anaplastic large cell lymphoma. We know those patients actually do much better. Uh, TP63 patients do worse. So I think that we could start with that basic information in anaplastic large cell lymphoma and hopefully, you know, work that's being done by Elaine and Laurence and other investigators will help us to identify markers in peripheral T cell lymphoma NOS and angioimmunoblastic, the other two common subtypes. How far away are we from having some of these markers available in routine uh, practice, you know, rather than just in the setting of clinical trials, yeah? Well, I, I think as Francine just showed, the best biomarker for now is a, is a good diagnosis mm. uh, and <laughs> <laughs> providing, providing the, the entity. Then as far as uh, DOSP22, for example, that's a precise uh, biomarker, let's say, uh, that's amenable by FISH. I mean, we certainly, uh, the centers of reference can perform the, the test routinely. Now in Europe, we're much used, more used to the idea of a center of excellence providing a more central pathological review. You do, of course, a lot of that work in consult, but within the US, the, the concept of, of regional diagnostic laboratories hasn't really kind of advanced the way that it has in Europe. Do you think that's what it's going to need in the US? 
I mean, I think that uh, the, the model, for example, in, in France with the LISA group reviewing all the lymphomas is, is really uh, shown the benefit of that approach. And, and uh, um, actually, uh, uh, ASCO, uh, I think, discussed this as an issue a few years ago, but has not really made progress to um, moving towards a more centralized review process for the U.S. Uh, in terms of standardizing molecular markers, I, I think the field will probably move towards, uh, for example, NGS panels, where you have a panel of, of your uh, uh, relevant genes uh, that can be done by a reference laboratory. And, and then the challenge is how you use that information once you have it, right? Yeah. Okay. The other group, of course, we discussed, the particularly poor prognosis group of, um, you know, at, at the AITLs. So there it was quite clear that there is a role still for transplant, allogeneic transplant. In the relatively few cases we see, the problem, challenge is always keeping the people in remission long enough to identify the donor and get them to transplant, particularly, I suppose, you're, the same as our practice, is probably mostly Caribbean and therefore quite difficult to identify donors for. What's your approach in, in that particular poor prognostic group? Well, I think it's important, um, and what I generally do when I first see a patient who I think has a poor prognostic markers or a bad um, histologic subtype, is I try to look for a donor right away. I try to identify whether there is a family donor and then look in the registry. Um, and now we're actually you know, doing haplos. So um, knowing that there's a donor available may actually change my approach to that patient. Or likewise, if there isn't a donor, then I know I'm going to have to try to get that patient into a deep remission and try to maintain that remission somehow. Um, so I think it really changes your approach to patients, and I think we ought to start thinking more upfront when we first see the patient as part of our diagnostic workup. We need to identify whether they are potentially a candidate for allotransplant and if they do have an appropriate donor. Um, and I think that really does help us to direct therapy from that point on. And the not the antibody that's now, I can't even pronounce it, that's now uh, approved in, in Japan. And then that intriguing issue, of course, it improves the outcome, but then was associated with a higher risk of graft versus host disease. Right, mogamalizumab. Well, thank you, mogamalizumab. <laughs> so um, is there a way in which you can potentially just have that further away from the transplant, the way we used to do with alimtuzumab? Or, is it, or do you think the, the, the complexity of this is just a little bit different? I think at this point in time, we really don't know what to do with that. But the very high incidence of graft versus host disease is alarming. and. Uh, our tendency at this point would be not to give the patient that antibody before the transplant, perhaps to identify patients who have donors and are going to go to transplant um, and then not give them the antibody. But again, you know, remember, John, that not all of our patients are going to fall into that category, probably 20, 25 percent. You know, that's a high number uh, that are going to move on to allotransplant. So I think certainly the other 75 percent of patients would certainly benefit from receiving that antibody. So here you have it, that the whole world of T-cell lymphomas is really being revolutionized over the last few years, a real understanding of the molecular pathogenesis of the disease. We're getting there, and everyone's very confident that that understanding will lead to improvements of treatment. So not quite yet, so hold, hold your horses.